let's continue. Continually devoted to the apostles' teaching, the Daskin. What else are they continually devoted to? Fellowship. Not coming to church, but koinonia, chita brut, being cemented together. Not in the Maoist sense of personality cloning, but in each knowing his own gift, whether you're an eye, a foot, or a hand. The eye is the lamp of the body, but thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Who are the eyes? Teachers. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Therefore, in Ephesians 6, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Who are the feet? Evangelists. But we're all under the head, Christ. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, please. We read Psalm 133, Hine matov umanayim shevatahim gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. We know that Aaron and the Hebrew high priest are pictures of Christ. The epistles of Hebrew tells us they're shadows of the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He is Hamashiach, Ho Christo, the anointed one. Our anointing depends on being under his head. Notice the oil never touches the flesh. It goes off the, the head, over the, off the beard, and over the robes. It never touches the flesh. Well, somebody gets saved through it. Yeah, I know his doctrine is false, but people get healed through it. It's nothing to do with him. The oil never touches the flesh. Many will come to me and say, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yes, you did. Now get lost. I never knew you. They proved nothing about anyone except Jesus if they're real, and many, what, much of what you see today isn't. You can be a very good eye, have the gift of teaching. You can be a very good evangelist. Oh, you can hear the voice of God, you can be a prophet, you can be a whatever. But it's no good unless it's attached to the body and under the head. An eye is no good in a bottle of formula and on the windowsill, and a foot is no good standing in the corner. It's ridiculous. It must be attached to the body and under the head. Fellowship. One of the most important verses to do with fellowship in the Bible is iron sharpens iron, thus a man strengthens his friend's countenance. The Hebrew word chichuch. <coughs> Friction. She rubs me the wrong way. She's supposed to. The first and foremost kind of fellowship God ordained is holy matrimony. Let's go back to our two friends, Jack and Jill. When Jack and Jill go off on that honeymoon we talked about earlier, Jack and Jill were in love. With love. <laughs> I love you because, because, because. 10, 12, 15 years later, it's I love you despite, despite, despite. Then Jack and Jill are in love. They were in love with love. Now they're in love with each other. The test of a marriage is not that there's no friction, but does the marriage grow despite it and even to a degree because of it? The test of a fellowship is not that there's no friction. Everything is always lovey-dovey, mamby-pamby. God brings us into fellowship with those who will rub us the wrong way and us them to make us both more like Jesus. We fight over moral issues and we fight over doctrinal issues but we don't fight over personal and political issues. That's not a good enough reason to walk out of a marriage, a personality conflict. You should have thought of that before you made the commitment. So it is. People who are out of fellowship are out of God's will. In the last days, these people will fall away. Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the fellowshipping together, especially as you see the day approaching. This is using something called kalvahomer, first principle of Midrash from the Medot of Rabbi Hillel. 
If you can't stand in a good time, you're never going to stand in a bad time. If you can't stand together when there's no persecution, what will happen when deception and persecution multiply and you have to stand alone? Those people will fall away. Proverbs 18.1, he who remains alone quarrels against all wisdom and seeks their own desire. No matter what reason someone gives you for not being in fellowship, what it really comes down to is their arguments are quarreling against all wisdom and they're seeking their own desire, not what God knows is best for them and best for others. Now, I accept the fact that there are people who cannot find a biblical church near where they live. I accept that. It's getting more difficult to find good churches these days, even biblical churches. However, who said a church has to be in a building? Meet in a home. Meet with other like-minded believers in a home, in a committed relationship. Who said you have to meet in a church in the sense of a building? Yes, you have to be a church, but not meet in one. The Bible never teaches any such thing. Fellowship. Fellowship. Koinonia. The community life, not just attending meetings, but being part of the body under the headship of Christ, exercising your gift under the control of the head in harmony and coordination with others. You walk where you're going. Your eye is related to your foot, but it's coordinated by the brain, the head. That's fellowship. I don't like my feet, they're too big. Tough, they're yours, live with it. I don't like the music director. Tough, that's your brother, that's your sister. There's gonna be friction. Friction is one of the things God uses to deal with our old nature. We only fight over doctrinal and moral issues, ethical issues, we don't fight over personality conflicts. Fellowship comes second. Look what comes next. The breaking of bread. The early Christian had agapes, love feasts, in which they took the Lord's Supper. Now understand, the Lord's Supper is very different when you understand it comes from the Passover. For one thing, the Jews were told in Exodus 13, when your children ask you why you eat the Passover, it's because of what the Lord God did when he took me out of Egypt. Children want to be like their parents. Even educational psychology acknowledges that. Why do you take the Lord's Supper? Because of what Jesus did when he took me out of the world, Egypt being a symbol of the world. When our children were little, our children born in Israel, when they came to England, our daughter was baptized, our son wasn't. And our son would see that his older sister, his mother, and his father were taking the Lord's Supper. He couldn't. But this is my family. What's wrong with me? Am I not fully a part of them? Well, no, Eli, you're not. You have to put your faith in Jesus and be baptized. Then you can take this. It's a way to teach your children. When someone is facing the imminency of biological death, if someone is terminally ill and God's not going to heal them, the Lord's Supper is the way that God gave to prepare us for bereavement and for facing going to be with him and leaving this world temporarily. Jesus knew he was going to die the cruelest of deaths, and when you're going to die, you don't spend your time talking about the pop charts or about the rugby scores. You spend your time talking about the things that are most important, spending your time with those who are most important to you. And he said, I long to eat the Passover, the Pesach, with you, but I say to you, I will not do this again until we do it in the kingdom of my Father. When we take the Lord's Supper as a body, as families, as married couples, as parents with children, as siblings, we're saying, the Lord may not come first, we may go to be with him first. But if I go to be with him before you do, or you go to be with him before I do, I die, you die, we both die, we become temporarily separated by biological death. The same as we eat this bread and drink this cup now, we're going to do it again at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Passover is a looking back and a looking forward. The Jews look back to the redemption out of Egypt, but are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and so we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We look back to Calvary, but we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If someone is terminally ill, what they need to do is to take the Lord's Supper with their loved ones. 
the same as we do it now, we're going to do it again. You'll see the benefit that has both spiritually and emotionally, not only for the person who's ill, but for his family. And it will make it much easier for them to handle the bereavement. It's the way the Lord ordained for us to do it. But you just can't come and do it. Eating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner can result in physical illness and even biological death. It's a way the Lord uses to keep us right, <laughs> keep us repenting. If you strain relationships, remember, it's a siddur. The order is important. Get the doctrine right. What's the doctrine of the Lord's Supper? It comes from the Passover. Get the fellowship right. We become one body that we may never forget him. We become one body. We've got to put relationships right with each other before we come to his table. It's a way to keep us repenting, lest we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. Then we come to his table, proclaiming his death until he comes. But before the Jews could eat the Passover, they had to purge the leaven, the bedichat chametz. Leaven is a symbol of sin, particularly of pride, and also of false doctrine, the leaven of the Pharisees. Before we come to the Lord's table, we purge the leaven. We repent of our sins. Don't come until you've repented of your sin. It's a way he keeps us repenting. It's a way he keeps us united to each other. Additionally, before the bedichat chametz, the purging of leaven, there was the washing of the yachatz ritual in the Passover today from the Passover Haggadah, the washing of each other's feet in biblical times. Peter said, all of me, clean all of me, not just my feet. Jesus said, you're already clean because of the word. It's only your feet. Our feet is what comes in contact with the fallen world. In here, in the fellowship of God's people of the living, out there is the dead. You're handling corpses all day long. You're out there working in the nine-to-five world in an office or a hospital or a factory with unsaved people. You're working with the living dead, with zombies. They're dead. In here, you're with the live. Before you eat, if you were handling corpses all day, if you were a pathologist or an undertaker or a grave digger, what you would do is clean your hands very carefully before you ate your dinner. And so it is when we come to the Lord's table. We wash each other's feet. What does that mean? We restore each other from our contact with the world. When you're out there, what kind of a week did you have, uh, 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 Gus? Well, my week wasn't too bad. I was witnessing to the guy next to me, but you know that other guy on the other side, the next desk, he's got pinup girls on the wall, and he's always smoking and telling filthy jokes, and there's a, a gambling pool going on in the office, and it really drags me down. I just get so dragged down. I feel so worldly, and, and, and I try to witness, but the cigarette smoke and the cursing and the filthy jokes. And, and it's okay, brother. It won't last forever. Well, Barbara, what kind of week did you have? Well, you know, the baby's been teething and having fever. We're not getting much sleep, and I'm finding it so hard to pray. I can't spend time in the Word. I can't pray. The baby always just is at that time. Well, that's okay, dear. We all go through these things. We wash each other's feet. We refresh each other from our contact with the world before we come to the Lord's table. It's fundamental. The doctrine of the Lord's Supper must be right. The fellowship must be right. Then we have the Lord's Supper. But last is prayer. Why? Again, it's a siddur. It's an order. They were Jews following a liturgical view. Not liturgy in the ritualistic sense, but in the sense of what it means in Hebrew. Let's say that. It's a set in order. The Lord's Supper, we remember the cross, the blood. The only reason we can pray the only reason we have access to the Father is because of the blood of the Lamb. You understand? The only reason we have that access, the only reason we can pray is because of what Jesus did. That's why the Lord's Supper precedes the prayer. That's not to say we shouldn't pray before we go out on the, into the meeting, but it is to say that the real time of, of coming together in corporate prayer, to pray corporately, you have to be in fellowship with each other. I can't stand him, I can't stand her. You can't really pray corporately then. That's got to be put right. You can't take the Lord's Supper. That's put right. Now let's understand this. 
The order is important. Doctrine, fellowship, Lord's Supper, prayer. Now notice, although Peter, at that point, preached the kerygma, they didn't devote themselves to Peter's teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In Acts 15, at the first council, it was not Peter presiding, it was James. If Peter was the first pope, obviously Peter should have been presiding, but Peter was not the first pope. It was the apostles' teaching. It wasn't some person claiming to be infallible. Only Christ is infallible, attributing divine attributes to himself. This is Antichrist in place of Christ. They're putting a man in place of Christ. It was the apostles' teaching. In ecclesiastical polity, you will always find plurality. The apostles were sent out in pairs, but they were accountable to each other in Acts 15. It was a joint ministry in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit had set out for me Barnabas and Saul. No one man chose. No one man chose. The senior pastor is the primus inter pares. The senior pastor, it may be the way that James is functioning as the one who presided in Acts 15, or it may be the way Peter was here in Acts 2, but he is only what we would call primus inter pares, Latin, first among equals. The way that Moses trained up Caleb and Joshua is a model of discipleship adopted in the New Testament. The way Paul trained up Timothy and Titus was the same. The idea of Moses and Joshua, that was a Old Testament principle of discipleship adopted in the New Testament. But it is not a principle of New Testament leadership. This idea of the pastor, the senior guy, the head honcho, he's the man. This was an error invented in the early church by someone called Ignatius of Antioch. The theological term is called monoepiscopacy. Monoepiscopacy. One dude, one overseer. It's from Scopus, the Greek word Scopus. Not biblical. There were reasons Ignatius invented this. People were getting into all kinds of crazy doctrines, so people looked to churches where the, they, the, the churches were planted by the apostles. They would look to Jerusalem, they would look to Corinth, they would look to Antioch, they'd look to places where the apostles were like Ephesus and say, well, the church in Ephesus got their doctrine directly from, from Paul and John and Peter, so we'll go there. So we'll look to the pastor there to have right doctrine. That's why they invented it. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. Monoepiscopacy gave acceleration to something that Jesus said he hated. Nicolaishianism. Nicolaishianism. Suppression of the laity, people. A clergy class back under the law. Again, an Old Testament system of leadership based on the Levitical priesthood, or based on the monarchy. Okay. Overlords over the people. New Testament leadership was plural. Wherever the apostles planned churches, there was a plurality. Secondly, biblical leadership was always...
functional and relational. It was not, absolutely not. clerical and higher article. Biblical leadership was functional and relational. It was not clerical and not hierarchical. Every Christian is a minister. We don't all have the same ministry, but every Christian is a minister. Every Christian is a priest. If you're not a priest, you're not a Christian. Christ is the high priest. Okay. Only God can ordain a minister. Now, do I have an ordination certificate and a license? Yes. Why? Let me tell you why. Okay, I want to be in fellowship with other preachers who have the same views I have, doctrinally and so forth. I'm in a movement with mainly ex-Pentecostals who pulled out of things like the Assemblies of God and the Elam cult over the corruption and the false doctrine. I want fellowship with others, but, and they gave me a credential, but that's not why I have the credential. If it's going to help me to do the work of God, Paul says, go along with it. For me to be able to sign a, a wedding certificate, pronounce someone man and wife, for me to be able to sign a burial certificate and have somebody legally committed to the, to the earth until the resurrection, for me to get into a hospital when it's not visiting hours, for me to get into a jail, in my case sometimes out of one, if that ordination certificate is going to practically open doors, I'm happy to have the ordination certificate. But you never see me going around calling myself reverend, even though I am one. I don't go by religious titles. Now, if it's a practical thing to, to be it, I'll do it. But that's not, that, it doesn't make me any more reverend than you are. I'm about as reverend as a bouncer in a burlesque show. It doesn't make me any more Christian or spiritual or higher or better than anyone. It's functional and relational. I may have a certain ministry of leadership. That doesn't make me higher than a person with the ministry of servantship, we're all called to be servants. People with the gift of helps, I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, you see the pastor God uses so much and blessed, it's the little old lady who washed the church steps, who prayed for him five hours a day, you're going to find out who's who. It's functional and relational. It doesn't make anybody in leadership any different. Now, some may be in full-time ministry, some may be in part-time ministry, but it's functional and relational. It's nothing to do whether or not you're in full-time or part-time. Some may have a theological education, some may not, but that doesn't affect the person spiritually. It's functional and relational. Only God can ordain a minister. It's functional and relational. And it's plural. When you find models of church government that are autocratic and that are hierarchical and centralized, instead of plural, and functional and relational, you're looking at something unbiblical, and that church will eventually self-destroy. It will self-destroy doctrinally and then morally. It's just not biblical. As Wesley said, if this is what's happened to Methodism when I'm alive, what will happen when I'm dead? Plural. Notice biblical ecclesiology was apostolic. It was apostolic. It comes from the apostles. For instance, Jesus cast demons out so we should have a deliverance ministry. No, 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 no. Jesus never cast a demon out of a believer. Not until he died and rose from the dead were there believers in the New Testament sense. No place is a demon ever cast out of a believer. 
and all the instruction the apostles give in how to apply and live out the teaching of Jesus, where did they ever teach deliverance? Where did they ever teach, teach casting demons out of? They never did. It's not apostolic Christianity. Deliverance is a racket and a business. It's a con job and con game very often. It's not apostolic. All of our beliefs and practices must be apostolic. It wasn't psychologized. Biblical psychology is the book of Proverbs. It wasn't what you see today. Secular psychology using Christian jargon. It's not apostolic. Our faith is apostolic. Now understand the kinds of apostles you have and had in the book of Acts. Jesus is called ho apostolo in Greek. He is the apostle in Hebrews. The Greek word apostle is apostolo. The Hebrew word is shaliach, shaliach, one who was sent, as in the pool of Siloam, shaloach, same, same. One who was sent to plant the church. Jesus is called the apostle in Hebrews. He's unique. All other apostolic authority has to derive from him. Other apostles, okay, but he is the apostle. He's the only autocratic apostle. Nowhere do you ever see an apostle acting as one. The spirits that set out for me, Barnabas and Saul, Jesus sends them out in pairs. Okay. He's the only one who is singular in what he does, teaches. Paul and Barnabas had to report back to Antioch, give account. At Acts 15, they had to give account. They were always accountable. Apostolic authority meant and still would mean accountability. Accountability and again, plurality. He is the apostle. Then you have the 12. The 12 apostles correspond to the New Testament, the New Testament equivalent of the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the sons of Jacob. They're the basis. They had to be around from the baptism of John the Baptist. Even Paul could not be among the 12, even though Paul had the same authority. Forget about people who said the apostles acted in the flesh by casting lots for Matthias. That's simply not true. Uh, Paul was not qualified to be counted among the 12 because he'd not been around from the time of John according to the book of Acts. Secondly, thirdly, sorry, we have the unique case of Paul. Like the others, he saw the Lord and received his doctrine directly from Jesus. Look at the way Paul mysteriously writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Last Supper. I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. He actually speaks about the Last Supper as if he were present. He had the same authority as the others. Barnabas may have been in the same class. But we have another category. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read Paul's rebuke to the church there because they were following men instead of God. In verse 12, he says, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. I am of Paul. I'm of Cephas, that's Peter, but then you had Apollos. He didn't see the Lord. Some speculate he may have written Hebrews, but if he did, he did it under the tutelage of the others, as well as the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Apollos. Jesus is in heaven. He remains the apostle. The 12 apostles are in heaven. They remain apostles. Paul is in heaven. He's an apostle, but he's not here. 
The only kind of apostle that can exist today is this kind. What is this kind? A shaliak, a church planting missionary. Somebody sent under the guidance of the Holy Spirit by one church to plant another. They exist today. There are no more Pauls, no more Peters. There will not be any more. The same as the Hebrew prophets were chosen and inspired by God to write the Old Testament, the apostles were inspired by God and chosen to write the New. The New Testament is a doctrinally complete canon. There is no more apostles, except in the sense of a church planting missionary. It's the same word in Greek and Hebrew. Does apostolic authority still exist? Yes. Where? Here, in the teaching of the apostles. Apostolic authority was the authority to define doctrine, to interpret and establish the teaching of Jesus. This is apostolic authority. This is the apostolic tradition. Not the patristic authority from the church fathers. That begins to go off. This is the apostolic authority. Yes, apostolic authority exists in what they wrote. This is it. When you see people today claiming to be apostles, look out. Now, when you send out a team to plant the church, make sure there's at least two. There's accountability and plurality. But today, you don't see that. What you see today is a deception called restorationism. Its pioneer in this country is Hudson Salisbury. In England, it's Gerald Coates, who came and falsely predicted in New Zealand the earthquake that never happened at Lake Talpo. It's Terry Virgo. It's the late Bryn Jones. It's restorationism. They tried to restore three things that never existed, based largely on a misinterpretation and mistranslation, in part, of Ephesians, of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. They say it's the fivefold ministry in Greek. Technically, it's four, but I won't go into that now. To them, it's a pyramid. It goes back to Arthur Wallace's explanation. The top is the apostle, then the prophet, etc. And the pastor and evangelist and the rest. They say we're restoring apostolic authority. No, they're restoring something that never existed. What they are calling apostolic authority is not apostolic authority. It is what Ezekiel 34 calls heavy shepherding. which is, among other things, a formula for financial exploitation and a lot of other things. Secondly, they have another version of prophetic authority. In the Bible, people who predict things that don't happen, as Benny Hinn has done, as uh, Kenneth Copeland has certainly done, as, above all, Rick Joyner has done, as Kansas City false prophets Mike Bickle and Paul Kane have done, as Cindy Jacobs has done, they're still considered to be prophets. No, they're false prophets. Just like the founders of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness, they predicted things in God's name that didn't happen, were commanded to reject them. If they really repent, they'll stop trying to pretend to be prophets. They aren't. They're false prophets. What they are is soothsayers. What's today usually called prophecy is not biblical prophecy. Most of what is being passed off as prophecy today, we've warned in the past, is clairvoyance. This is restorationism. That is not biblical apostolic authority. The third thing they try to restore that's not biblical, in addition to their view of apostolic authority and their view of prophetic authority, is the Calvinistic error adopted by charismaniacs of post-millennialism. Kingdom now. 
triumphalism, the idea that the church is going to conquer the whole world for Christ before he comes. There'll be no antichrist, no falling away. Revelation and Matthew 24 have no future meaning and all these other deceptions that I won't go into now. This is just lunacy. Did Jesus separate the sheep from goats in 70 AD? <laughs> That's what they think. Crazy. So, biblical ecclesiology is apostolic. But let's continue in Acts chapter 2. What do we see? Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. This is called Nisim Veniflaot, signs and wonders. Biblically, these signs follow. These signs follow. Jesus never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or his ministry. These signs follow. Jesus never had a healing crusade. He had healings, and unlike Benny Hinn, his could be medically documented. He had healings, but never a healing crusade. Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. You see people flocking to stadiums for this. You see people flocking to arenas for this. That is what Jesus said is a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign. It is wickedness and adultery. It is satanic. At best, carnal. Often demonic. These signs follow. All Jesus had to do was put on a show for Herod. He wouldn't have been crucified. But he only did what he saw his father doing. God is sovereign. We cannot make these things happen. Most of what you see today is a combination of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception, or else just pure con artistry. It's hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception, or else it's just con artistry, or some combination of the two. Now, I'm not a cessationist. The idea that the gifts of the Spirit end with the apostles is not biblical. It is a false doctrine. I believe in signs and wonders, gifts of the Spirit, understood and practiced biblically. Most of what you see today is simply not biblical. This is what's biblical, what's apostolic. We cannot make it happen, but we can prevent it from happening. If we had right teaching, right fellowship, Remember, the Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and our worship. The focus of a service should be the Lord's Supper. It's the focus. You don't correct error with error. Because of the Roman Catholic abomination of the Mass, denying the sufficiency of Calvary, Rome said Jesus has to continue to die sacramentally. They combine this with Aristotelian philosophy, coming up with the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is debunked by modern science, leading to the idolatry and cannibalism of the Mass. So to correct this idolatry and cannibalism, Protestantism played down the Lord's Supper, only doing it once a quarter or on special occasions, or in some cases once a year. No, no. It should be done regularly. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. It's the center of our worship. If you had right teaching, right fellowship, right worship, and right prayer, as in thy will be done, not my will, I believe God for that Mercedes. Right teaching, right fellowship, right worship, right prayer. We would see more biblical manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. You can't make it happen, but you can block it. By having wrong teaching, wrong fellowship, wrong worship, wrong prayer, you can block the authentic. So people wind up going to Pensacola, Florida, or Toronto, Canada for a counterfeit because they don't have the real. They don't have what's genuine because they're blocking it. Get this right, and then the Holy Spirit can work. But in this ecclesiology, we see something. 
Again, I always quote my favorite rabbi, Eifo levevecha shameh ye gam ken otzarecha. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. My favorite rabbi is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, me that said it, Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing will show our attitude towards God more than our attitude towards wealth and possessions. And those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. Corporate living, communal living. Sometimes Jesus said, come, join my merry band of men. But with the woman at the well, he said, no, go back to your community. With the demoniac against Serene, who Jesus saved from that demonic possession, Jesus said, no, go back. Don't come with us. Stay here and tell the people. We're not all called to live that way, but we're all called to be willing to live that way. Now, understand why they lived that way in the book of Acts, in the beginning of the book of Acts. The reason they lived that way is this. If Jesus Christ came to your town and said, this whole place is going to be ransacked in an invasion. Stick together and prepare to leave town. Wouldn't you put your house on the market? <laughs> Move down to the church. When I give you the signal, get out. And that's what happened under Simeon after James was martyred. Simeon was the cousin of Jesus, a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, as you read about in Eusebius and Josephus, they escaped. They actually thought it was the rapture. Actually, it was a type of prefiguring of the rapture. They got out of there. The place was going to be destroyed, so they began selling their property. There was a reason. The Lord might lead you to do it in a given situation. However, there's a danger when you live cor corporately or communally. Social parasitism. This became a problem in Thessalonica. Paul had to say, if you don't work, you should not eat. It was people who just looked for a free ride on the back of the church. Paul had to make the distinction between widows and widows indeed, those who should be financially assisted by the church and those who should not. So all together, Jesus is coming soon. They thought he was going to come in their lifetime, although they allowed for the possibility he might not. And uh, the apostles were their teachers and their pastors. Everything swelled. People are getting saved. They forgot about being his witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They never got out of Jerusalem. While the Lord delivered Peter from prison, he didn't del deliver Stephen. He allowed Stephen to be martyred because it made the church get moving. God put an end to their communal living. That's the danger. You get introspective. You lose your capacity to relate to unsaved people. It's how God leads in the given time. I've lived that way, and I've lived not that way. Now, in Africa, we have a children's village called Ebion. And we have orphanages for little babies with AIDS. Our missionaries take care of these little babies that unless Jesus, unless Jesus heals them, they're going to be dead before the age of eight or nine. We just take care of them. Our missionaries give them as much love. We put them in a family environment instead of an institutional environment and teach them about Jesus. You're going to be with Jesus soon. And by the age of eight or nine, they do. Our missionaries share their computer software. They share the toothpaste. They share their money. They share everything. They live that way. It's the right way for them to live. Are we all called to live that way? No. Are we all called to be willing to live that way? Yes. Should the need arise and the Lord so lead. Are we all called to pray for and financially support those who do live that way in the mission field for the sake of the gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't have a single model in the book of Acts of the way a church should be. In Acts alone, we have three identifiable models. We have the Jerusalem model, the Antioch model, and the Greek model. However, the principles of koinonia, of shoot the foot, of fellowship, the fundamentals of ecclesiology will be the same in each of them. Now, there's one final thing we need to look at in this passage we've just read. It says they met in the temple and house to house. They met in the temple and house to house. That's important. 
day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. How can you continually devote yourself to fellowship, as it says they did? Well, you can continually devote yourself to prayer by praying all the time, even when you're driving to work. You can continually devote yourself to teaching by living it out. But how do you continually devote yourself to fellowship? There's only one way. In 1 John, we are told this. In God, we, of course, have fellowship. He himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. This is the message you've heard that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he himself was in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You can't always be in vertical relationships, but you can always be in a horizontal one. If you are in vertical fellowship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit, you are automatically in horizontal ones. You're automatically in horizontal ones. Okay. Continually devoted to fellowship, you can always be in fellowship with Jesus. Okay. Then we're automatically in fellowship with each other. We'll want to meet with other Christians. House to house and in the temple with one mind. Well, how can you have one mind when people have different views? It's easy to have same doctrine if you're all trusting the same Holy Spirit to guide you through the same scriptures. But some people like hymns and some people like choruses. How do you have one mind? I have my mind, you have your mind. What is the mind of Christ? <laughs> it's in the temple and house to house. Notice they took the Lord's Supper house to house. Who says we have to have the Lord's Supper on Sunday in a building. There are things you can only achieve in a large group, that temple. A large, a crowd draws a crowd, an evangelistic outreach. In the temple, it makes a statement to the community. If you get a large enough group of people together, they can fund the missions program, they can begin a Christian school. I'm in favor of putting Christian teachers into state schools and getting Christian children out of them. Temple. There are things that can only be done in big groups. Bring in an outside speaker, things like that. But house to house, there are things that can only be done in small groups. Real fellowship can never take place in the temple, in a big group. Real fellowship can only take place house to house. 10, 12 people gathered around the Lord's table in a house. Somebody is never going to develop their gifts in the temple. You try to play the piano, your brain will become disconnected with your fingers. If you try to preach, your knees will be knocking and you'll be stuttering too much. You discover and develop your gifts in small groups. There's things you can only do in small groups and things you can only do in big ones. There's a dynamic. House to house and in the temple. There's times to meet in small groups and there's times to come together. Whether or not it's in a church building is irrelevant. The house is the basis. The early Christians understood that. Taking their meals together with gladness, fellowship meals, agapes, love feasts, praising God and having favor with all the people, not necessarily the religious establishment. If you live out biblical ecclesiology, if you live out New Testament Christianity, you're not going to have favor with the religious establishment or the institutional churches. But you will have favor with the people. <laughs> Jesus never came to establish his denomination. I'll leave you with one last thing. When you have unity of the Spirit... When you have real fellowship, when you have a real biblical ecclesiology,
church is either the local fellowship, the local congregation, or the universal body of Christ. All you need is a fellowship of fellowships. The Plymouth Brethren understood that at one time. The Baptists understood that at one time. Calvary chapels understood that. You have a fellowship of fellowships. Because you have a unity of the Spirit based on a common doctrine, one faith, one baptism. Once an organization begins to fragment doctrinally and spiritually, you will see it will become more united organizationally, politically. It will become more autocratic, more centralized, more denominational. When you see a movement becoming a denomination, it is dying spiritually and ultimately it will die morally. They tried to compensate for the lack of unity of the spirit with an institutional unity. <laughs> like the Church of England or the Roman Church, you hold it together with property trusts, you hold it together with pension funds, you hold it together with money, with laws. But then, why? Because it's no longer held together by the Holy Spirit. Once you see something denominationalizing and becoming hierarchical, once the autonomy of the local fellowship is eroded, once a movement becomes hierarchical and centralized, it is declining spiritually. It's no longer spiritually united, so they're trying to compensate for the lack of real unity with an institutional unity. And so we have biblical ecclesiology. I've got to be honest. In New Zealand, I've met many true Christians. In Great Britain, I've met many true Christians. In Australia, I've met many true Christians. In the United States and in Canada, I've met many true Christians. In South Africa, I've met many true Christians. I've met many true Christians in many countries. Switzerland, Israel, all over. I've met true believers. Many true Christians. But the only places I have seen true Christianity is either where the church is persecuted and or impoverished. Oh, I've seen true Christians in America or New Zealand or Britain. I've seen true Christians in South Africa or Australia. I've seen people who love the Lord, who believe the truth. I've seen true Christians. But true Christianity? The closest thing I've seen to true Christianity in the Western world is usually prison fellowships, people saved in the joint. And they've been doctrinally corrupted by Colson and ecumenism. If you want to see true Christianity, come with me to the Middle East. I'll show you true Christianity in the Persian Gulf. Come with me to our mission stations and our orphanages in Africa. I will show you true Christianity in the third world. I will show you our missionaries. I'll show you true Christianity in Kenya or in other places of the third world. I'll show you true Christianity. I've seen true Christianity where the church is impoverished and more so where it's persecuted. Here in your country and in other countries like it in the developed world, I have not seen true Christianity. I've only seen true Christians. But before Jesus comes back, and if persecution is what it takes, that's what it's going to take. I'm not praying for persecution by any means. Right now, we only have true Christians. Before Jesus comes back, we are going to have true Christianity. God bless. <laughs>